almost from the beginning of time, man has sought to imitate the perfection of nature through his art, through his industry and science. This quest has been unending. Even after the triumph of the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, there remained visionaries who saw in the flight of tiny hummingbirds a further goal. And through time and patience and uh, invention, they were successful. What they created was a most unusual craft that takes to the air on spinning wings. In its various forms, it resembles a bubble, a tadpole, even a banana, but never a bird. Nothing so graceful or so beautiful. The helicopter is a rather ungainly looking machine. Some might even call it ugly. <laughs> but as they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And the helicopter has been winning converts for years. In fact, it has proven so useful that more UH-1 Hueys have been built and placed in combat than any other modern military aircraft. That's why they called it the Jeep of the Vietnam War. The tactics used in that conflict would have never come about without the development of this awkward looking machine. Troop transport, medevac unit, supply ship, gunship. It was used for everything by every branch of the armed forces. It was quite simply the most versatile tool of war we possessed in Vietnam. But tools are only inanimate objects until man takes them with skill and understanding and courage and puts them to use. With the best of tools and the best of men, this process creates a synthesis. The right tool can mold the man just as surely as the man wields the tool. It becomes an extension of his body. And together they face the enemy and drive with fierce determination directly into the fire. When the American fighting man saw the helicopter in 1950, it was an awkward contraption, difficult to fly and unreliable in service. But it had one unique ability. It could land and take off without a runway. This strange spindly craft was not new, however. The concept of vertical flight had occupied dreamers and inventors for centuries. Leonardo da Vinci had drawn plans for a vertical flying machine in the 15th century. Other visionaries produced drawings, models, and even full-sized experimental craft. Some of these could lift off the ground, but continuous controlled flight proved to be an elusive goal. It was not until the 1930s that the Frenchman, Louis Breguet, produced a machine that exhibited real stability and control. His craft is generally considered the first practical helicopter. In 1936, the German Heinrich Fokker built his first FW-61. And after setting new speed records for a vertical lift machine, a military version of this fragile craft was put into production. The first helicopter ever to go to war. In America, it was the Russian-born Igor Sikorsky who proved most successful. His VS-300 was modified and improved considerably during four years of development that began in 1939. It was the first really successful helicopter to use a single main rotor with a second small torque compensating rotor on the tail. With the knowledge gained from this craft, Sikorsky produced the R-4, America's first military helicopter. Introduced near the end of World War II, the R-4 made history in April 1944, when in its first month of service, it rescued four downed airmen in the Far East Theater of War. But by the end of the Second World War, the helicopter had hardly made its presence felt. It would be five years before most American fighting men would see this versatile craft in action. That was Korea. By this time, a variety of designs were appearing. The three most common American craft were the large Sikorsky H-19, 
the smaller HO3S, and the Bell H13. Korea is a mountainous country with cold winters and muddy springs. Getting severely wounded men to quick medical assistance was a daunting task. The helicopter proved the right tool for the job. In the early months of the Korean conflict, the battle lines have been pushed back and forth across the countryside. In order to keep battlefield losses to a minimum, the Army established four mobile Army surgical hospitals, or MASH units as they were commonly called. Using tents and portable equipment, they could move with the front, always remaining relatively safe, five to 25 miles behind. All four units received many of their most severely wounded patients by Air Force and Army helicopters. The MASH program was clearly successful. The speed and ease of helicopter evacuation saved lives. Wounded men could receive help fast and with less trauma than provided by the hard and bumpy ride of a ground ambulance. The helicopter was beginning to define its role in the field. Choppers were also used by the Air Force, the Marines, and the Navy to recover downed flyers, frequently behind enemy lines. Navy helicopters, like the little Sikorsky HO-3S, could be stationed on ships off the Korean coast and reach a downed pilot in minutes. However, the early helos were hampered by low power and high maintenance requirements. The HO-3S had a severely limited lifting capacity. The difference of only a few pounds could be extremely significant. Towards the end of the war, the Marines experimented with another tactic, using their new, larger HRS-1 Sikorskis to airlift supplies and fresh troops to the scene of battle. In the final weeks of the war, the Army deployed their first full helicopter transport squadron to Korean shores. But the chopper's mission called for the deployment only in the case of an emergency. They were still considered too delicate and unreliable for routine use. Still, it was a beginning. And it was clear, even though this war was winding down, that the story of the combat helicopter had only begun. Eight years after the Korean armistice, it's 1961. President John Fitzgerald Kennedy signs orders to send American military advisors and American helicopters to a small Southeast Asian country, Vietnam. It's a continuation and a modest escalation of a policy that began with President Eisenhower. But this is not Korea. This is a guerrilla war. There are no front lines. Large segments of the countryside are in the hands of the communist Viet Cong, who, assisted by the North Vietnamese army, intend to unite their country under communist rule. In the South, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the Avon as it is called, is demoralized and ineffective against this insurgent threat. What can the American advisors do to turn this situation around? The men who arrived with the helicopters in December of 1961 were not the first Americans in Vietnam, but this was the first major buildup. Officially forbidden to take part in combat, these soldiers and pilots nevertheless provided transport for Arvin troops and accompanied them in the field. The battles had been going on for over three years, and the Americans were determined to show the Vietnamese how to turn the tide in their favor. Matters were not helped by the varied levels of readiness of South Vietnamese troops. Some commanders of the South Vietnamese forces seemed content to carry out their war at arm's length, 
relying on artillery and airstrikes to subdue an enemy which they seem to have no interest in meeting face to face. With reports of nearly 600 incidents of attacks, sabotage, sniper fire and harassment coming in daily from around the country, some Arvin commanders showed little enthusiasm for the task of meeting the enemy. It was up to the advisors to change this. And they would do it with a new tactic they called air mobility. Using their twin rotor CH-21 Shawnee choppers to carry troops and advisors, Arvin units would fly directly to reported enemy activity or suspected strongholds. Accompanying them would be a new tactical innovation. Gunship helicopters, carrying fixed forward firing machine guns and rockets. New helos were often adapted in the field for this purpose. They carried modest factory armaments and any additional weapons their crews could adapt to fit. After gunships had swept prospective landing zones, called simply LZs, troops would advance into the field. The gunships could stay on as a sort of aerial artillery, directed by the field commanders. Helicopters could also serve as observation platforms to monitor enemy movements. In this manner, the Arvin troops could remove key units of the Viet Cong guerrillas. The Arvin and their American advisors could pick their own battles and surprise the VC with lightning fast response, setting down troops wherever they wanted in a matter of minutes and then later removing them to fight elsewhere whenever they chose. That was the theory, at least. And in the first several months of escalated conflict, it worked with startling efficiency. A surprise Viet Cong used to picking the time and place of their own battles were forced into quick and disorganized retreat, often escaping relatively unscathed, but leaving behind large stockpiles of badly needed ammunition and supplies. Supporters of the doctrine of air mobility were ecstatic. Still, actual contact was minimal. The raids appeared too easy. The helicopter had not yet had its trial by fire. That was to come at Op Bach. On the morning after New Year's Day, 1963, Ten CH-21s and a group of UH-1 Huey gunships took off from the dirt airstrip at Tan Hien. The landscape lay below them, shrouded in a misty ground fog that hugged the treetops and pooled in the rice paddies. The CH-21s, or flying bananas as they were called, carried the first installment of what was to be a full battalion of Arvin troops and 51 American advisors. Their mission was to surround and move in on the village of Apbak, where intelligence reports indicated they would find a VC radio station and a small number of enemy troops. In fact, they were flying directly into the home base of the Viet Cong's 514th Battalion, a force of over 400 prime fighting men who were stationed just outside of the village. To make matters worse, the LZ picked out for the third landing was right on their doorstep, at the heart of the village's most heavily defended positions. Discipline among the VC was excellent. They waited until the last of the CH-21s were about to set down, and then opened fire. A lengthy battle ensued. Arvin troops remained pinned down for hours, unable or unwilling to even return fire, much less advance against the enemy. Within minutes, Four helicopters were down, and a fifth so badly damaged that it was forced to land prematurely on its way to the base. In the end, it was the VC who retreated under cover of darkness with few casualties after dealing a crushing blow to their attackers. In addition to the five downed helicopters, another 11 were seriously damaged. Killed in action were three American advisors and 65 Arvin troops, with more than 100 injured. 
lessons had been learned. The gunship helicopter was vulnerable even when armed for self-defense. The twin rotor CH-21s presented a large, slow-moving, easy target. The Hilo's unique talents and flexibility made them invaluable, but they had to be used carefully. Even so, air mobile deployment was still the only obvious solution to the problems of Vietnam. But one result of Opbok was the quick retirement of the old, vulnerable CH-21 transports. Taking their place was the smaller, newer helicopter that accompanied them on that ill-fated mission, the UH-1 Huey. The U stood for utility, not a glamorous designation, but pilots were quick to take to this tadpole-shaped machine. The Huey was the first American military helicopter to be powered by a turboshaft engine. Essentially a jet engine that used its exhaust to propel a turbine linked by transmission to the rotor blades. By its nature, it made a lighter and more reliable power plant than the heavy piston-driven engines it replaced. The original UH-1A was quickly superseded by the more powerful UH-1Bs and Ds, with larger engines boosting their torque by more than 200 horsepower. Soon, entire assault teams were being planned using nothing but Hueys. The Eagle flights, as they were called, proved extremely successful. A typical Eagle flight was made up of 14 Hueys. One armed gunship chopper would serve as an airborne command post. Five more gunships would provide escort and cover fire. The seven troop transports were called slicks because their lack of armament gave them a smoother profile. Each one could carry 10 to 12 troops. The last Huey was outfitted for medical evacuation. An Eagle flight would stand in constant readiness, either on ground or in the air. When scrambled, the gunships proceeded to the LZ to soften it up for troop landing. When the slicks arrived, the gunships circled to provide covering fire as necessary and returned to base with the troop carriers to await the order to pick up the soldiers and take them home. As time went on, it became apparent that the communists' highly capable intelligence network allowed them to anticipate any joint U.S. Arban action planned far in advance. But the speed and flexibility of these Eagle flights allowed the Americans to keep the upper hand. When Lyndon Johnson assumed the reins of the U.S. presidency on November 22, 1963, in the midst of an American tragedy, he was already familiar with the Vietnam conflict. He told Henry Cabot Lodge of his resolve not to lose, saying, I am not going to be the president who saw Southeast Asia go the way China went. Within a year, it was clear that Johnson's conviction would mean increased aid of substantial quantity. The stage was set for the introduction of combat troops. American boys would go to war for the first time since Korea. The effects of this war would shake the nation. The first American combat troops in Vietnam were Marines. They started to arrive in March of 1965. By October, the 173rd Airborne and the 1st Air Cavalry were there, and they'd brought their choppers with them. By the end of December, Total U.S. strength in Vietnam had jumped from 23,000 to 181,000 men. And everywhere, the low rhythmic pulse of whirling blades echoed throughout the sky. What the new troops found was a land both lush and impenetrable, with winding rivers and submerged rice paddies in the south mountains and dense jungle in the north. It was a country of tribes whose rivalries and centuries-old disagreements created deeply divided factions not obvious to the casual observer. They would fight two enemies, the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong, who rarely showed themselves but could appear anywhere. Short periods of intense fighting would alternate with long weeks of apparent inactivity. So it seemed. And yet much of the time it was to be a shadow war. 
where booby traps and mines alone accounted for more than 10% of U.S. casualties. It was to be a war fraught with uncertainty and contradiction. And for these troops, that meant tremendous frustration. With no clear battle lines and vast expanses of untracked jungle, real estate could not be taken and held in the manner of conventional warfare. Once again, it was the UH-1 Huey that did the job. Troops would have to be deployed by choppers to hotspots as they occurred. When the battle was over, the troops were forced to return to their base, leaving the villages and countryside underprotected, more often not protected at all. Without the ability to place themselves permanently on the offensive, American commanders were locked into a strategy of attrition. In terrain like this, the enemy was almost impossible to surround and contain. When they chose to break off contact, they could just melt into the jungle and move on to fight somewhere else another day. The Yadrang Valley was to become the site for the first air cavalry's insertion into combat. This was where the concept of air mobility would have its most important test. The young men of the CAV had staged full-scale maneuvers only twice before they were packed off to Vietnam. Now, on October 19, 1965, uniformed North Vietnamese troops attacked a special forces camp near Ply May. That brought the first air CAV into action. General Westmoreland handed the CAV's commander an order to find, fix, and destroy every enemy soldier between Ply May and the Cambodian border. The hunt began, and over the next month, 50,000 combat missions and supply flights were made. The first team moved entire battalions by air, brought in heavy artillery slung under big CH-47 Chinooks. and ferried 5,084 tons of supplies to the men in the field. In the end, two full NVA regiments were in ruins. Even more important, only 59 American helicopters were hit by enemy fire, with only four shot down, three of which were recovered. This became the pattern for future assaults. Large deployments of hundreds of helicopters in coordinated use with artillery and airstrikes. But only rarely did they have such an appropriate opposing force as they did in Yadrang Valley. The enemy learned fast. They too could play at a war of attrition. There was no question anymore about air mobile deployment. It was clearly a tactic that could win battles. And even with the vulnerable helicopter, its losses were considered acceptable. Never wants to be satisfied with merely acceptable losses, however. The men who flew these birds of war had their own ideas about how to fight. Happiness is a cold LZ, the saying went. A landing zone where there was no opposing fire is what they meant. The four-man crew of the troop-carrying slicks were bound to find their own ways of self-preservation as well. Increasingly more powerful machine guns were mounted in the doors, first hung from large bungee cords, then mounted on various field rig contraptions. The door gunner was a man who stood always in full view of the enemy and continuously poured thousands of rounds of suppressive fire into the surrounding jungle. Pilots might grouse about carrying troops into hot or booby-trapped landing zones, but they seldom hesitated when the time came to take troops out. If a patrol was pinned down, a jet airstrike could be there in minutes, bringing thousands of pounds of napalm. Even more effective were the APAM cluster bombs, falling like fluttering leaves. Lethal in the extreme, they did the job when they landed on target.
It was up to the pilots to fly into these hot areas and pick up the troops as fast as they could. Taking hits from enemy rounds was part of the job. The only problem was in how many and how accurate they were. Typical of these brave pilots was Marine Captain Stephen Pless. Pless had good reason to be cautious. A career military pilot, he put in over 1,000 hours of combat flying in Vietnam and twice survived being shot down. He was two months away from ending his tour there when in August of 1967, he and his crew rushed to the aid of another chopper that had been downed. Before their astonished eyes, they watched a group of VC grab the injured crewmen and start to beat and bayonet them on the ground beside their ship. Pless's gunship dropped low, strafing the attackers with machine guns and rockets. Then Pless flew his ship straight to their aid, landing and engaging the enemy in face-to-face -face combat. He and his crew managed to grab the surviving Americans, pull them aboard, and take off while receiving direct fire. For this act of heroism, Pless was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Thus, the men who flew the choppers gained the respect and gratitude of the men in the field. Respect is hard won. The ground soldiers, or grunts as they were universally called, held the Hilo crews in a special esteem that no words can describe. They trusted the choppers to get into the battle. And when the time came, they knew the pilots would do everything they could to get them out. The Huey had become ubiquitous. It was everywhere. Here was one tool of war that was used by every armed force. The Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. But this one machine couldn't do everything. See, gunships were becoming more and more essential to helicopter tactics. Yet it was apparent, almost from the beginning, that the venerable Huey was never designed to be a primary weapons platform. Would it be possible to create a helicopter specifically designed as a weapon. And how long would it take to develop a powerful, highly survivable machine to test it, produce it, and deploy it to the field? Though several companies tried to meet the Army's need for a gunship, the answer ultimately came from Bell Helicopter, manufacturer of the UH-1. First arriving in the field in 1967, it was an answer few had expected. Everyone else tried to design a new helicopter from the ground up, but Bell took the mechanical guts of their classic UH-1 and built an entirely new aircraft around it. What they ended up with was awesome. The U for utility was changed to A for attack, and the new machine entered service as the AH-1G Huey Cobra. Inside the sleek, compact fuselage were only two crewmen, a pilot in back, and a gunner up front. Turning towards the enemy, the Cobra, often called simply the Snake, presented a narrow, hard-to-hit silhouette. Four hardpoint mounting stations were contained on two stub wings. The wings helped to relieve strain on the rotor at high speeds, making the ship more maneuverable. A large variety of weapons could be fitted and refitted in the field, depending on mission requirements. In a 
addition to miniguns, rapid-firing 20mm cannon and 2.75-inch air-to-ground rockets were available. Working in conjunction with the old UH-1 slicks, the Cobra's faster speed allowed it to run ahead to the landing zone, cutting flight time to a minimum. Once there, it could attack with enormous, devastatingly accurate firepower. Automatic guns, cannon, grenade launchers, and rockets were all part of the potential payload. Before the end of the war, even anti-tank missiles had been fired from Cobras in combat. The Tet Offensive in 1968 provided some of the most vicious, sustained combat of the war in both city and countryside. The Communists had launched an all-out effort to hand American forces a solid defeat. The onslaught of Tet would prove one of the most significant tests for the AH-1. Could it provide the cover necessary for the troop-carrying helos? And would it prove itself survivable under heavy fire? By now, Cobras were in-country, working in teams with the UH-1 slicks, in enough numbers to be fairly judged in battle. It was time for the Cobra to prove its mettle. As the Slicks deposited their troops in the LZ, the Cobras could circle the area, riding shotgun for the men on the ground. Any fire from a concealed enemy revealed his position, and the AH-1s had the perfect vantage to respond to this opportunity. Ever practical, the men in the field were not completely convinced until they had tried the new machine. Pilots expressed the reservation that, without a door gunner to watch the chopper's flank and tail, the Cobra might actually be more susceptible to enemy fire than the old Huey. In practice, however, with the slender AH-1 circling above the troops, the Cobra proved a difficult target for the enemy on the ground. Its speed, low profile, and ability to stand off at higher altitudes while still delivering accurate fire made the AH-1 an ideal teammate on assault missions. Before long, it became clear that the Cobras were a resounding success. The commander of the American air base at Bien Hoa said of the AH-1s, they swept down about two feet over our heads and fired into the enemy positions, knocking out the troops who had pinned us down. The Cobras were the turning point in the enemy's destruction. Tet wound down, there could be no mistaking that the AH-1 Cobra was here to stay. It had taken the helicopter nearly 20 years to prove itself on the battlefield. And it was during the years in Vietnam that this ugly bird had come into her own. And in so doing, gained the respect and the affection of the men who flew it. Yet the emergence of the chopper as a weapon never overshadowed her other uses. When all was said and done, the most honored, and in many ways the most harrowing missions performed by the choppers in Vietnam, as in Korea, were those incredible missions of rescue and medical evacuation. From the annals of the Vietnam War, there emerged no more famous pilot than Army Major Charles Madman Kelly, commander of the 57th Medical Detachment of Helicopter Ambulances. Kelly's unit, whose radio call sign was Dust Off, 
flew UH-1s with the familiar Red Cross emblazoned clearly on their nose and side. It was a sign that warmed the hearts of wounded soldiers, but was ignored by the enemy. Air ambulances received just as much enemy fire as any other helo. Later on, the familiar Red Cross was eliminated from some helicopters entering hot areas because the bright red and white paint made the craft such an easy target. Madman Kelly was a man with a mission. He was fiercely dedicated to the role of medical evacuation. Dust-off choppers carried the wounded of all nations to the welcome relief of hospital wards. Stories of his courage became legend. Kelly flying at night into dangerous LZs. Kelly landing to pick up Arvin casualties with bullets flying through the cockpit. Kelly taking the extra time, even under heavy fire, to get everyone on board before takeoff. By his actions and valor, he set an example in the early years that medevac pilots tried to emulate for the duration of the war. When commanders questioned the value of his fellow medevac pilots' experience, whose duties they had assumed to be free from combat, Kelly responded, I fully realize that I do not know much about the big program, but our job is evacuation of casualties from the battlefield. This we are doing day and night. Without escort aircraft, and with only one ship for each mission, the non-medical units fly in groups, rarely at night, and always heavily armed. Kelly saw his medevac flights in Vietnam as missions of mercy, and nobody did it better. One July morning, Major Kelly and his crew flew to the aid of an Arvin unit in contact near Vinh Long. As he came in close, his Huey began to receive enemy fire. One advisor radioed Kelly to clear out. When I have your wounded, he calmly replied. Sadly, it was not to be. Just before landing, a round whistled through the helo, striking Kelly in the heart. Even though Major Kelly was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, as well as a number of other medals, his greatest honor came from his fellow pilots, who preserved the Kelly ethos that the wounded must be saved above all else, and who added the phrase, dust off, to the lexicon of Vietnam a term to this day synonymous with all military medevac units. With the onset of strategic bombing of North Vietnam, there came the need for another sort of mission of mercy, search and rescue. Since speed, endurance, and considerable overwater flying were required, the prime workhorse of the search and rescue team became the Sikorsky HH-3 Sea King. A huge, powerful machine, the HH-3 gained many friendly nicknames, but it was best known as the Jolly Green Giant, or sometimes simply, the Big Mother. The Air Force as well as the Marines each had their version of the Jolly Green. The name was applied to the HH-3, the CH-3, and CH-53 model choppers, and they had many uses. Ideally suited to the rescue mission, the Jolly Green was equipped with heavy armor plating and self-sealing fuel tanks to protect the crew when the hovering bird was hit by gunfire. With the additional advantage of in-flight refueling, this big helicopter had virtually unlimited range and endurance. A typical flight would have the HH-3 and a pair of prop-driven A-1 Sky Raiders take off from the carrier deck to remain on station near the coast of North Vietnam during a bombing raid. Close at hand, they could respond immediately in the case of a downed fighter.
In order to remain ready, helicopter in-flight refueling became a regular practice. Whether from ship or aircraft, the process was delicate and required considerable skill from the pilots. Airstrikes over North Vietnam were a dangerous task. In addition to North Vietnamese fighters and anti-aircraft guns, the enemy had begun to make extensive use of SAMs, radio-controlled surface-to-air missiles. When a carrier aircraft suffered battle damage, it would head for the coast. The pilot waited to eject, if possible, until he was over water. On alert from a nearby ship, the Sea King and its crew of four would head for the coordinates of the downed aviator, radioed by his wingman, and monitor the signal transmitted by the pilot's emergency beeper. The Sky Raiders, or SPADs as they were called, provided primary cover for what was known as a rest gap operation. Their extensive firepower and naturally slow speed made them excellent team members for the HH-3. Over the years of the conflict, search and rescue techniques and deployment advanced from rough emergency procedures to a finely honed system of strategy and tactics for recovering down pilots in an expensive air war over North Vietnam. Hundreds of pilots, who might otherwise have become prisoners of war, were returned to their bases to fly another day. From routine acts of heroism sprang the image of the helicopter crews as saviors from the sky. Uncommon valor was a common virtue. These words spoken by Admiral Nimitz of the men who had fought at Iwo Jima during the Second World War had proven as true in Vietnam as they had all those years before. The helicopter crews earned the admiration and the respect of everyone, from grunt soldiers in the fields to jet pilots. And if sometimes they seemed to cultivate the image of fearless warriors who would brave anything to save a fellow soldier in distress, they were neither foolhardy nor show-offs. They knew all too well the bloody toll of battle. They faced it daily, logging thousands of flights and tens of thousands of hours in what was one of the most harrowing jobs of the war. And in this course, the machines they flew had proved themselves as tools of war. The value of the helicopter had surpassed that for which even its most visionary adherents might have dreamed. It is said that true courage is not gauged by the absence of fear, but rather by the willingness to proceed in spite of it. In doing what had to be done, these helicopter crews forged a bright new tradition of bravery in the face of overwhelming odds. These men who owned the skies of Vietnam answered the call and flew without hesitation directly into the fire.